Good morning. Welcome back to Planet Doug behind the scenes for Friday, November 24th, 2023. And the first thing on my mind this morning, I'm not sure what to call this kind of a topic, life thoughts, random philosophy of life thoughts. I don't know what bucket to put this topic into, but for whatever reason, it's the first thing on my mind this morning probably because I'm busy making some plans about what to do next and I'm looking back over the last year of my life and not just now but over the last <clears throat> 10 or 15 years I think I've noticed a pattern in the way I think about things and like right now looking back over the past year I would conclude that everything I did was a mistake like every choice I made was the wrong choice. And again, looking back over the past year, all I see are the poor choices I made and I can see all the things I wish I had done, right? And I've been thinking about that a lot lately because that's how I always think, to be honest. If I look back over my entire life until today, it seems like every choice I've ever made was the wrong choice for one reason or another. Everything I've ever done has been a mistake. That's what I see when I look back. But I wonder if that's an accurate way of looking at your life or is it a, is it a useful way of looking back over the past? Is it even accurate? So maybe the problem isn't that I keep making mistakes. Maybe the problem is that I just have a bad attitude. So instead of the problem being my life choices, the problem is just the way my brain works. So for example, right now, looking back over the past year, as I said, I conclude honestly that everything I did was a mistake and I see all the things I did that were wrong, and I see a, a very, very clear image in my mind of all the things I wish I had done. I see the mistakes now, and I see, see so clearly that was the wrong choice, but this, this would have been the right choice. I wish I had done that. But what if I could go back in time and make all those choices, like all the things that I see right now that I view as the right choice, what if I could go back in time and relive the past year and make all those choices? And now I'm sitting here today and I've made all those different choices, how would I feel now? Probably I would look at all those new choices and I would say, oh, those were all mistakes. Everything I did was wrong and I wish I had done this other thing instead. Do you see what I mean? It's like you can't win if you have this, maybe that's a more accurate way of looking at the situation and the way my brain works. I like just can't win that no matter what choice I make, I will always see it as the wrong choice. And then maybe other people just have a healthier brain and they could have lived the last year of my life, made all the choices that I've made in the past year, and they'd be sitting here perfectly happy and thinking, yeah, that was amazing, that was great, I love that. Like they just have a positive, sunny outlook instinctively. It's just the way their brain is wired. And the, maybe the problem with me is not that I always make the wrong choices, that I always make mistakes, Maybe the problem with me is just I have a bad, a negative attitude. And no matter what choice I make, I will always regret it and think I should have made another choice. I, I don't really know. I remember there were times in my life, quite recent ones, where I did something. And at the time, it really did seem like the right, not, not really, not just the right choice, but that I did really well at when I was in that period of my life. This isn't like, this is all pre YouTube. So this is like all in my past life. Now that I'm talking about, I was doing something. And at the time I was very proud of what I was doing. 
and I was glad I was doing it and I thought I was doing a really good job. But now when I look back, I don't see it that way at all anymore. All I see are mistakes, everything I did wrong, and I can see how this period of time that I was so proud of, I was still doing everything wrong. I just wasn't aware of it at the time. It just took me a while to get some distance on it. Now when I think back to that period of time, it's like, yeah, what, like, what is wrong? Like, why did you do all those things you should have done instead of A, B, and C? You should have done, you know, D, E, and F. All your choices were wrong. So it's like, <laughs> I just can't win. Um, to be honest, this is not a new thought for me. It just happened to be on my mind this morning. And most of the time when I go through this sort of a thought pattern, I just end up concluding that it really doesn't matter. There's nothing to be gained by regrets, by looking back in time and wishing you had done something different, wishing you had made a different choice, because you can't. There is no option to go back and make a different choice. That's just how things work. But of course, if you do look at your life from this point of view, you'd think you could learn lessons from the past. Like I'm looking back over the past year, seeing all the mistakes I made, and now I have to make new choices. Well, based on this experience, now I can make the correct choice, right? Moving forward, I can incorporate all those lessons from the past. But of course, my situation right now is very different from what it was a year ago. So if I think back over the past year and, and wish I had done this and this and this, that doesn't really apply anymore because I'm in a completely different situation now. So it's like a, a no-win situation. This is like a game you can never, ever win. So maybe the problem is just a, a bad attitude. I guess it really is just the classic, you know, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Do you see the cup as being half full or half empty? And I think, you know, I'm, I'm not... Uh, you know, I don't think it's a terrible thing to be a pessimist. Like, I think I am a cup half empty kind of person. I always see what's missing as opposed to what's actually there. And yet I still really enjoy my life and, and do all kinds of things that I enjoy. So it's not like it, uh, you know, causes me to go around in a mope all the time. You know, I live a fairly rich and interesting life despite all of that. It's almost like I can have two mindsets at the same time, and I wonder if other people are similar to me. Um, I haven't heard people talk about this, but I feel like I can keep two completely opposite perspectives in my brain at the same time, where I can believe 100% that everything I've ever done in my life has been a mistake. Every choice I've ever made has been wrong, 100% I believe that, but at the same time, 100% I can also conclude, yeah, I lived a pretty good life, you know? Um, there's nothing I could do about all those mistakes I made, but even as I was making those mistakes, you know, my life turned out pretty well. I really have nothing to complain about, and I'm really happy about all the experiences that I've had. So I can hold these two opposing states of mind that are completely opposite, I can hold them both at the same time. I regret everything, like everything. I regret everything, but I also regret absolutely nothing at the exact same time, right? It's like my brain is able to keep these two states simultaneously. And I guess that's how it is that my life kind of balances out. And I don't know if anyone else has that ability or whether that makes any sense at all. But uh, yeah, that's where I am this morning mentally as I enjoy my uh, cup of coffee. As far as YouTube stories and current events go, my brain is still occupied with this whole idea of, you know, migrants, illegal immigration, refugees, and this, this started from, this is a topic I'm always thinking about, 
but in the last couple of uh, behind the scenes videos I was talking in particular about the Darien Gap, that jungle, mountainous, rain-filled, river-filled jungle separating Panama from Colombia, and then we have this migrant trail where in, in recent two or three years the number of migrants from Venezuela, other South American countries, and from all around the world, the number of migrants going through the Darien Gap trying to get to the United States to cross the border, whether legally or illegally they want to get into the United States, that migrant flow has just exploded. Um, it's gotten dramatically larger. And then I've been watching a lot of documentaries about it, a lot of news reports, current ones, as well as going way back in time. I've been doing a lot of reading online, a lot of articles about it, getting all the information I possibly can. And then in the middle of all that, bald and bankrupt, the, the famous travel YouTuber, he decided to walk through the Darien Gap with the migrants and film it. And I watched his two videos so far about that experience. He wants to go all the way from Venezuela to the U.S. border. And then he's going to document the whole journey. That was his plan from the beginning. And he's posted two videos so far one about going from Venezuela into Colombia, and then a second video about traveling to the jumping off point in Colombia where you begin the trek through the Darien Gap. And he documented his hike through the Darien Gap. And I had a lot of thoughts about his video overall. I was quite negative about it. And then um, after that, I was waiting for his partner's video because he was traveling with another YouTuber, a man from Greece. His name is uh, Timmy Carter, and that's the name of his YouTube channel as well, Timmy Carter. He's a bit of a, uh, yeah, he's a YouTuber, travel YouTuber, and he and Bald and Bankrupt joined up to do this hike together, and they both filmed separately. So they're posting videos separately about their experiences. And then Timmy Carter, he just posted his video about the hike through the Darien Gap. And that's mainly what I want to talk about this morning because it was really quite interesting. But before I get to Timmy's video, I'd like to mention that some, a few other things going on because in the middle of all this, I went back in time and I watched some other videos from like six or seven years ago, like big documentary series from big media outlets so this is like six or seven years ago. Uh, there was a kind of an explosion of stories about the Darien Gap and the migrants going through it. But when you watch all these stories from six or seven years ago, the situation was completely different. Now, for example, the vast majority of the migrants are from Venezuela from South America, but from Venezuela in particular. And they're on track for 2023 to have half a million people walk through the Darien Gap. And that's the situation that Bald and Bankrupt and Timmy Carter were in, in the middle of this massive flow of people that's going on right now. And they've carved out a route that starts from the coastal town of Necocli, that's where everybody starts their journey, and then they take a boat across to one of two towns, um, Ancandi, Akandi, or Capergana. And then you choose which one you want to go to, and then from those two towns, you can either hike through the Darien jungle uh, along different routes, or if you have more money, you're, you have more money to spend, you can take an easier route by taking a series of boats from Capergana up to Panama and sneak into Panama that way. So that's the situation now. But seven years ago, that Necocli to Akandi or Capergana route, that wasn't an established route. So what these people documented six or seven years ago is more from the south, where there's the, the highway going through Colombia, and then from way at the southern edge of the Darien Gap, they start walking right there and walk to the north through the whole jungle. It's, a, I think, quite a bit more difficult journey because the modern route is much shorter. You actually come into the Darien Gap from the side 
and you actually go over one jungle, bunch of hills, till you get to some rivers, and then you follow the rivers to the refugee camps. But before that route was established, going in from the side, because they, you know, they travel way up to the north, Nekokli, then cut over, and then basically they're hiking to the west. They take a boat kind of northwest, and then they hike to the west. But the original route was more south to north. And those are the videos that I was watching. And the population was much smaller. You know, there were very, um, a couple thousand, you know, migrants a year. I don't know the exact, depends what year you're talking about. But now, of course, we have, like I said, half a million migrants. But back in those days, in a year, there might be 20,000 total, um, rather than 500,000, something like that. And the migrants themselves were from other places. They were from, uh, you know, you saw a lot from like Bangladesh, from Pakistan, from India, from some African countries. You didn't have this massive flow of Venezuelans yet. That was still coming in the future. And I remember one of the documentaries that I watched, you know, a journalist went into the Darien Gap, just like Bald and Bankrupt did, and he wanted to document the journey of the migrants and go with them. So he went into the start of the migrant trail, but he couldn't find any migrants, right? He went to the village where he was told, this is where they all start their journey from. And then they get a guide, like a local guide, to you know, bring them through the jungle. So he went there you know, with his cameras. I think he had a film crew with him, like one other man with a camera. And then his, you know, he was going to meet up with all the migrants and go with them. But when he got to the village, there was nobody there. There were no migrants. So you know, with Bald and Bankrupt, he had no trouble at all finding the migrants because you go to Nekokli, you go down to the dock, and there's going to be a couple thousand of them, maybe several thousand of them, all trying desperately to get onto the boats and then you go onto the trail and you're on the trail with hundreds of other people they say right now that there's two and a half thousand people every day going through the darien gap on the various routes so you might have 500 people a day on each route so if you're hiking along a trail you're basically in the middle of almost a, a traffic jam people ahead of you people behind you you're all just walking you know, there's so many migrants, you can't miss them. But back six or seven years ago, this guy, he couldn't even find the migrants. There were so few of them. And he had to spend a lot of days in this village just sort of waiting for any migrants to show up. And then he actually hired a local guy with a boat to take him up and down the river looking for migrants. And then they went up and down this river. And then just out of nowhere, they stumbled across a group of migrants from you know Bangladesh, I think. And they were all kind of lost in the jungle. They were trying to get through the Darien Gap, but I don't think they had a guide and they said they were lost. They didn't know where they were going and they'd been out in the jungle for days, running out of food and water, really in bad shape. So this journalist met this group and says, well, I'm staying in this village where there are guides and there's a place where you can sleep and you can get water and food. You, you can basically get you can get um, set up for this journey, like basically start all over again. So then he took this group of migrants that he met and brought them out of the jungle back to this village. And they stayed there for a few days and got ready and found guides and paid them and got you know, geared up to go. And then he set off with this group of migrants to document their journey. But as I said, he had to go looking for them. There were so few of them he had to go find his own migrants in order to get them to set up, you know, so he could go with them. So it's a very, very different situation back then compared with, uh, you know, how it is today, you know, when Bald did his journey. And very, very different from when Itchy Boots did it. But of course, Itchy Boots didn't do it illegally. She was there with a motorcycle and all she wanted to do, she didn't want to go through the Darien Gap because she's doing it legally she has no need to sneak through the jungle. She was able to get customs documents, visas, and basically go through immigration and then hire a boat, put her motorcycle on this boat, and then go to the first city in Panama, go to the immigration office. This was at a town called, 
uh, I forget the name of the city right now. I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. It's the very first small town in Panama on the coast. There's an immigration office there. And so, you know, Itchy Boots just went to the dock in, you know, Capragana and got in a boat with her motorcycle and they went around the peninsula, went into the dock at this town in Panama, got off the boat, went into this immigration office with her passport, you know, and they stamped her in with a tourist visa. And then she took another boat up the coast all perfectly legal and perfectly normal. And that was just, I don't know, three, four years ago that she did that. And it was a completely different scene then compared to what Bald and Bankrupt uh, saw now and what Timmy Carter saw. So yeah, all very interesting. And in that this is where my mind has been over the last few days. And of course, I've been following the story of the Rohingya. These people fascinate me because I've been to Myanmar and I've been to Bangladesh, and if you go to either of those countries, you hear so many stories about the Rohingya, of course, that a lot of them fled from violence and persecution in Myanmar, and they fled across the border into Bangladesh. The Rohingya are Muslim people, and um, that is basically the cause of all of their problems within Myanmar, because the Myanmar people are Buddhist, so there was tension between them, and then the Rohingya were driven out, and there's like a million and a half of them, I believe, still in refugee camps in Bangladesh, and they're in a pretty bad situation, and they really have nowhere to go. And I guess, I, I don't know as much about them because I haven't been reading up on their history and things, but I saw in the news, I'm sure everybody saw in the news, that boats were landing on the coast of Sumatra around in Aceh province to the north and all these boats were coming from um, the refugee camps from Bangladesh from Myanmar so I guess it happens every year when there's a break in the weather like when the good season starts and the ocean is nice and calm the Rohingya will pile into boats and flee and then just try to get the boats to Malaysia or to Indonesia. I think based on what I've heard and what I read, a lot of them in this, they, they want to get to Malaysia, but it's easier perhaps for the boat to get to Indonesia, to get to Sumatra. And then they're hoping to be able to land in Indonesia. And if they can live in Indonesia and work here and settle down in, in Indonesia, they would, but they're also thinking about continuing through Indonesia and then eventually getting to Malaysia. Because I think the Indonesians in general don't really make room for them. Um, so there's a very small group of Rohingya refugees living in Indonesia now, but I think there's like 100,000 of them in Malaysia. And Malaysia's economy, I guess, needs more workers right now. And anyway, there is this idea that it's better to go to Malaysia, get a job, work there, and Malaysia might allow more of them into the country than Indonesia. So I think that's what's going on. But what really jumped out at me was the image of the boat. The very first story that I saw, they had photographs, of course, like screenshots from the video and photographs of the boat that, that contained, I don't know, 300 Rohingya refugees and the boat, the visual of that was stunning because it looked like a boat from centuries ago. We're not talking about a modern ship of any kind. It looked like it was something that escaped from the set of Pirates of the Caribbean. And there were so many people on this wooden, this old wooden ship so many people on board it looked like there wasn't even room left over to stand they were so crowded and so packed in and of course lots of children lots of women young men and then of course they all landed on the coast of Aceh and the local people there uh, basically told them no keep going um, they landed and then the local people brought them food and water and they got a lot of media attention and probably local NGOs were coming to give medical care and things like that. But in the end, they were told, you know, you can't stay here. We're going to give you food and water and help you as much as we can. But, you know, we're farmers here in this part of Sumatra. We can't take care of you. We, we can't really do anything for you. We don't want you here. So 
okay, we've helped you as much as we can, now get back on your boat and go. So these people were forced to get back on this boat and then just go out into the ocean. But of course, they had no choice but basically to drift around and then land on another part of Aceh, another part of Sumatra, and eventually try to find a place where they can come ashore and then get processed as you know, political refugees, you know, seek asylum in Indonesia and then continue on from there. But I find that I find that to be a you know, fascinating story. I've always been interested in the stories of uh, refugees. It's something that's been a big topic worldwide, you know, my entire life and uh, Canada in particular, you know, being a land of immigrants, um, the United States, a land of immigrants, it's part of daily life there. Um, immigration is where how Canada formed right and just people come from all over the world and that forms the Canadian population starting with of course the big migration from Europe you know post World War II started as you know British colony and a French colony so it was originally populated by Europeans that was the migration driving the growth of Canada but of course in modern times that migration has stopped and now Canada's population is, you know, filled with migration from, from Africa, South America, Asia, people from all over the world coming into Canada. So the whole idea of immigration, migration, refugees is a very common one in Canada. It's something that gets talked about all the time and you see articles about it, stories about it. So it's something that catches my interest. And then this image of that boat that the Rohingya were on, which just yeah, kind of blew my mind just to think about it. Um, yeah, it's a very, very dramatic photograph. So that is kind of where my brain is at. This is the topic I've been thinking about, and that leads into my thoughts about uh, Timmy Carter's video going with uh, bald and bankrupt through the Darien Gap. And Timmy's video is called Surviving the World's Deadliest Jungle. And in the thumbnail, it says Darien Death Route. So just from that, you can guess that in tone and context, uh, context and style, everything about it, it's pretty much the same as the video from Bald and Bankrupt which I criticize to an extent um, for its high levels of sensationalism, the constant drumming of this story that they were doing something incredibly heroic and they were in so much danger all the time. Uh, Timmy Carter kind of took that even to the next level. Every time he turned on the camera and was filming himself, he was just listing more horrible, dangerous things. We could die, we could be killed, we could be murdered, we could be you know, held for ransom, you know, we could be tortured, we could be bitten by snakes, pythons, you know, the boat will sink, we will drown. It's just like an endless litany of these unbelievable dangers they were facing the whole time. And it all, for my money, got to be a bit much and this idea of making what is essentially a YouTube stunt video about the migrants who are facing these dangers for real. You know, it's a very serious topic. And then there's a danger with shooting a YouTube, you know, video like that, that it is really just a stunt video that is using the serious situation that these people in as entertainment. And that was kind of my overall feeling about Bald's video and I carried over into Timmy's video because they're very similar people, their style is similar, the way the things they experienced and what they said and what they shot is very similar. But before I continue on, I would like to say that I did have one other way to look at it that to me it seemed like sensationalism. Um, but I noticed that in all the thousands and thousands of comments on both of these videos, the vast majority of the comments were coming from people who, to my surprise, I shouldn't be surprised, but I was surprised, who had never heard of the Darien Gap, who were unaware of migrants trying to get from Venezuela to the United States, who had never heard of 
all these people struggling through the jungle, walking, trying to get across six or seven borders. To, you know, this was all new to them, right? So when I watch Bald's video, in my head, I'm comparing it to real journalism. I'm comparing it to all the documentaries I've seen over the years and all these yeah, serious journalists who go there to actually tell the story of the migrants. And they themselves as journalists aren't really the story. The story is the migrants. So I have that in my head. I know all about it. I've, I've known about the Darien Gap for as long as I can remember the migrants. And it's, it's very, it's not new to me. So when I compare Bald's video to everything else out there, then his video seems like a stunt, kind of like uh, a goof and very sensationalized. So I think of it critically, but yet his audience, the people that love watching his adventures, I guess they're not as aware of the world. And for them, it's new information. So in a way, Bald's video is doing good because it is raising awareness of this whole situation for a vast audience that apparently didn't even know about the Darien Gap, didn't know about the migrants and the struggles they face. So even though he did it in a sensationalized way, you know, he really did shine a light on this issue for a lot of people who apparently had never been aware of it before. So, you know, that's one, that's another way to uh, look at it, which is kind of interesting. Because, yeah, I, I read through all the comments and it does surprise me. It's like, how could you not know about this? Like, just turn on the TV and watch the news and the story is there. But apparently, it, you know, this is all new to people. And since then, I've watched some other videos like from uh, like van people, people who are traveling around the world by van. There was one in particular I'm thinking of. And they were trying to ride, uh, drive their van from, you know, Canada, the United States, through all of South, Central America. And they wanted to go to South America. And then apparently their viewers were all saying, well, why don't you just keep riding your van? Go from Panama to Colombia. So then these people shot an entire video about the Darien Gap, explaining to their viewers, like, no, there are no roads in the Darien Gap. You can't drive a car from Panama to Colombia. You cannot go overland from, you know, North America to Central America to South America. There is no overland route. And then their entire audience was also astonished. They're like, really? You know, we didn't know, you know, we'd never heard of this before. So I'm like, really? How could you not know? But anyway, so you can look at their videos from a positive angle from that point of view. So Timmy Carter, same as Bald and Bankrupts, but for my money, his video is better than Bald's because it is more extensive. He includes a lot more details and shows video at a lot more of the stages of the journey. Bald, maybe it's coming in his next videos, perhaps. Maybe they just divided up their videos differently. But I found watching Timmy's video, it filled in a lot of the blanks for me. Because you watch Bald's video and I just had nothing but questions. Like, okay, how did you get from here? Why did you? Like, what happened here? And then Timmy's video, of course, is still very uh very loose like there's no information no real information about well they they never talk about how much they paid for example they had they paid money to all these guides and smugglers they had one failed attempt you know where they went to capragana and then they hired a smuggler and paid for a boat to take them to here and that whole experience failed completely and they had to turn around and come back but they didn't say how much they paid the guy you know, then they had another route and they had to pay more. And Tim, Timmy at one point slipped. He says that, yeah, we paid tons of money to these guys. Yeah, we paid a lot of money. He does say that, but he never actually says how much does it cost? How much did he pay the guides and the smugglers? How much did the other migrants pay? How much is this costing people? He never mentions any prices. And they're very, very loose when it comes to time as well. It's hard. You have to really read between the lines to even figure out how long anything took. You know, how 
many days was this journey and when did you get here and how long did you stay there and what did you do while you were there? Where did you stay? How did you make, like all the logistics are just absent from his video and from Bald's. So it's still not a good video from my point of view. I want the logistics, but he does show more than Bald does and uh, I enjoyed the video from that point of view. So for example, when they were in Nekokli, um, Timmy had a little bit more video of the dock situation, all the hundreds of people milling around and trying to get on the boats. And what I found kind of interesting was that at one point, some guy came up to them, he guess he worked for a relief organization of some kind, and he was handing out water purification tablets. These tablets that can, you know, one tablet per liter of water, and you got all these migrants going through the jungle, and there's no way, if it takes them, five or six days to hike through the jungle, they can't carry enough water for themselves and their whole family. So they're drinking from the rivers and everybody's getting sick because the water is not, uh, not suitable for drinking. So these relief agencies are handing out water purifying tablets. And then Timmy showed that in the video. He's like, he turned to Bald and said, like, hey, this guy's handing out, yeah, maybe we should take some. And I guess they got three tablets each. So, they had enough purification with them for three liters of water each. And my reaction to that, you know, was a resounding, duh. Again, you know, putting myself in their shoes, you know, if Planet Doug wanted to go on a YouTuber journey through the Darien Gap, you can bet I've got water purification in my backpack. Um, to me, it is so obvious, I, it just astonishes me that the very idea of bringing something to purify water wouldn't occur to them. Especially when all they talked about were the dangers, how, you know, how this journey is going to be life-threatening at every level. You know, they could get lost in the jungle, they could die. To, you know, they, 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 they certainly talked a good game in terms of how dangerous this expedition was going to be. But again, I'm thinking, well, if you're so aware that it is this super dangerous, at the very least, pack water purification tablets or liquids or a water filter Ideally, you would have both. I would try to have both, like a high-quality water filter, one of these things you can pump. I've had those before in my life. But even then, I wouldn't drink the water. I would filter it through one of these pumps, and then I would add filtration. Me being me, I, I would bring a stove. I don't see why not. I have a cook stove. So I'd bring a cook stove with fuel to last me a week. And then you could boil water if you needed to out in the jungle. I mean, to me, these would be minimum preparations. And then what I noticed in watching all of these Darien Gap videos about the migrants, there's a serious risk. One of the biggest risks they faced were uh, spraining your ankle or breaking your leg because so many times they have to cross rivers and the riverbed is all rocky and slippery and then you're, you know, you're up to your knees or up to your thighs or waist in water and then you, they would even go down river for long stretches where there's no trail and they're walking through the river and a lot of people, Timmy did, he said, um, they, they twist their ankle and you're out there in the middle of the jungle, it's a little bit like I've compared it to climbing Everest in a previous video. It's a little bit like that, where if you break your ankle, you're kind of on your own. The other people in your migrant group, they barely have the ability to get themselves along the jungle trail. Uh, they're not going to be able to pick you up and carry you. You know, the families, I mean, they're carrying children. And for you to be out there in the middle of the jungle, you break your ankle on these rocks or you sprain your ankle, it could be a death sentence. So taking that into account, in my backpack, I'm putting some kind of pressure bandage, you know, some kind of a rudimentary first aid kit where if I do sprain my ankle, I can take one of these heavy duty pressure bandages and just you know, wrap up my foot and then put some splints in there and I can actually keep walking, you know, just 
I'm not talking about going in there with a, you know, a, a surgery kit, you know, like you're some sort of a wilderness doctor, but I mean the basics, water filtration, um, wound sterilization, because Timmy Carter, um, at the very, you know, I said they first tried to go by boat, that failed. I'll talk about more about that in a minute. But after their boat journey failed, they had to go back to Capergana, regroup, and then they paid more smugglers to go on a different route. And the first part of that route, they were on the back of motorcycles. And these guys were riding them on motorcycles to get to a camp. And then they could join a big group of migrants at the camp. So the first part was on these motorcycles. And then uh, he didn't have any video of it, but Timmy's, Timmy's guy crashed. I guess, you know, Timmy's a big guy. He says he's 6'4". He's a big, heavy guy, and he's on the back of the motorcycle. They're on this jungle trail, and they, they fell over, and it looks like the exhaust pipe landed on his leg, and it burnt him quite badly on his calf. Um, I've had that experience myself. It doesn't take long. You just touch your leg to the um, you know, exhaust pipe of a motorcycle. It's just instant bad burn. So right out of the gate, he crashed on the motorcycle, and he burned a big section of his calf. And then for a long time, he's in the jungle. And of course, he could suffer from a very bad infection there. So at the very least, again, I'd want some kind of an uh, antiseptic ointment that I can keep infection out of these wounds, right? I could go on and on. I, I even see these migrants where there are a lot of people are telling them, well, the trail is really muddy and there's a lot of water. So they buy these like hip wader boots, like, like farmer's boots that go up, you know, mid calf or something like that, these big rubber boots and they go hiking in those. And for my money, that's like the worst thing you can do because a lot of these migrants or all of them, I would say, they, they are not in the right physical condition. It's not like they've been hiking and hiking and hiking and are like robust. They're, they're just families now, just families and they think they can just start from zero and then start hiking through a jungle for five days. Yeah, that's hard. You know, you can be in peak physical condition. And then if you put on those rubber boots, you're going to tear your feet to pieces. You pretty much, you can't start a hike like that with new footwear of any kind. You know, your footwear has to be broken in. Otherwise, you're just going to get tremendous blisters. And that's what happens to all these people that get these boots, right? And um, yeah, so that seems like a poor choice for going through these trails. And I guess the boots are supposed to keep your feet out of the mud and wet, but of course it doesn't work. They're constantly in the mud anyway. Uh, um, and they're in the rivers and their boots just fill with water all the time because the water is above their boots. Seems like the worst possible footwear for that journey. Me being me, I, I would do it in a nice pair of, you know, hiking sandals. Seems like the best for me. Um, but you'd have to break in your sandals before you start the hike. Otherwise, you're just going to tear your feet to pieces with all the blisters. Anyway, these people didn't seem prepared for their uh, journey. Yeah, when they... Um, after the motorcycle trip where Timmy fell and then burned his leg, they got to this camp and then they, there they had to get guides. And then he shot a sequence where there was a local man there who gave him a tube of ointment that, okay, it's like, um, why am I having trouble? Antiseptic ointment and, you know, offered to, to give it to Timmy and then he could apply this um, lotion to his wound, you know, keep it from getting infected. So this local guy had enough sense to have this antiseptic ointment, but Timmy and Bald, you know, didn't bother with anything like that. And I have to say that Timmy's video, just like Bald's video, made me constantly question what I was seeing and hearing. A lot of it felt like there was inaccurate information or misleading information. And I, I ended up looking at the video and, and not really trusting what they were saying because a lot of things didn't make any sense. So right from Capergana, they paid to take this boat around a peninsula to Panama and the boat took them to a town called Puerto 
Old Baldia, and that's the place with the immigration office, and that's where Itchy Boots went. Interestingly enough, with Timmy's video, as I keep saying, it's a little bit more complete. So he has a shot of a few seconds of when they come around the peninsula, and you can see the settlement and the dock and some buildings, you know, where they're landing. Because they never say where they went. Like, Timmy doesn't say the name of the town. Ball doesn't say the name of the town. So when I watch their videos, I'm like, well, where did you guys go? Like, what's the name of this place? Because I want to track their journey. But then because Timmy shot some of the coastline, I was able to go to Google Maps, you know, go down to, you know, satellite view and get street shots. You know, you can actually see the, the coastline of Porto Albadia and I could look at the photographs on Google Maps. Actually, not street view because they're out in the ocean, but these are photographs that other people have posted on Google Maps because they were also on boats in that area and they took pictures of the shoreline. So I could see these pictures of the shoreline, compare them to the video, and they matched. So that's how I was able to conclude, ah, they went to Porto Obaldia. That's where they went, the same town that Itchy Boots went to. They never say that in their video. And again, I always wonder, like, why didn't they say that in their video? It always feels to me like they're hiding something, that they're keeping everything vague so that they can raise the level of danger that they're facing. But anyway, on this boat that they were taking, as I said, people who take the boat, that option are the wealthy ones. So any migrants that have no money, they have to hike through the Darien Gap. But if you have money to pay, then you hire one of these boats. That's the easy way. But Bald and Timmy didn't seem to even know that. To me, that's like Darien Gap Migration 101. Uh, it's, it's obvious to me, okay, those are the three options. Go to Akandi, go to Capragana, or you can take the boat. And the boat is for the richer people. I mean, that's the first thing you learn when you start doing research. So that kind of tells me that they didn't even do that much research because they had no idea what was going on. And then when they're on the boat, they had this big boat all to themselves. The boat probably could have held 20 people. You know, 20 migrants could have crammed onto that boat, but they were all by themselves. So Timmy and Bald were the only two people on this quite large boat. And uh, Timmy did say in the video, you, I think he was kind of embarrassed about that. He was like, like he was saying to, the, to his audience, like, honestly, guys, this isn't what we wanted. Like, we weren't trying to get privacy. We want to go with the migrants. Like, we thought we'd be with a whole bunch of people joining a group and going with the migrants. We didn't know we'd be, have an entire private boat all to ourselves. So they didn't even know what they were paying for. But even when he was on the boat, then he started talking about how dangerous everything was. He was, he was like, oh, this boat is so, it's old and rickety and we could die. We could capsize. We have no life jackets. Our boatman is 80 years old. And yet I was looking at that boat and it was like a pretty sweet boat. I was like, what are you talking about? In terms of getting over the Darien Gap, this is the lap of luxury. That boat looked to be in great condition to me. It was a big boat looked kind of new, looked in really great condition. Um, so I, I don't know what he was so worried about, to be honest. But anyway, so they took that boat to Porto Alba, Obaldia, and then the video, just like Bald's, smash cuts to them leaving that town. So one second they're on the boat going to that town, and then change of scene, now they're leaving. And then Timmy basically tells the same story as Bald with one major difference. Bald says in his video that we went, you know, we landed on the shore and then we went hiking into the jungle and started our trek through the Darien Gap and then we were caught by the Panamanian military. The soldiers caught us. Soldier, the military from Panama caught us, arrested us, put us in a prison cell and now we're being kicked out of the country. That's what Bald said. He didn't show any of this, but that's what he said happened. Timmy said almost the same thing, except without the jungle part. He said, he just basically left it vague. He just, they're on the boat leaving, and he says, oh, you know, oh, this was an amazing adventure. We were arrested, 
put in a prison cell and now we're being kicked out. And he talked about how scared he was, how dirty and horrible and terrible the uh, prison cell was that they were held in. And again, I find all of that a little bit overblown because the only thing we see on video, and it's, both, it's in Bald's video and Timmy's video, is Timmy coming out of the immigration office. So there's, there's a building with a big sign on it that says immigration office. And then there's a door and the door opens and Timmy comes out. He's holding his little um, bundle with his passport in it and things like that. And he's just walking out of there. And the next thing you know, they get on the boat and they're going back to Capragana. So, you know, the mental image they projected with their words, he should have been, you know, in shackles and chains and handcuffs with soldiers training guns on them and marching them back to the dock. But no, he was sitting probably minutes before that, sitting on a chair in an office, talking to an immigration official. And then they told them, no, you know, we're not going to let you into Panama. So, you know, you have to go back. And their boat was still there. The boat and the driver were still there, as far as I can tell. So I don't know how that worked either. Um, because they do say, you know, they were in a prison cell, and I assume they were held overnight. They were implying that. And yet, why was their boat and their boat driver still there in the morning? Now, he probably would have just gone back again. So, you know, I don't really trust their story. It feels embellished and uh, exaggerated. And I was thinking about this idea that Puerto Obaldia is an official entry point into Panama. What I mean is it has an immigration office. So Itchy Boots, he, she hired like the exact same boat that Bald and Timmy were in. It was the exact same boat that she hired and it's big enough to you know, put in a 500 pound motorcycle and rope it down and stuff. You know, it's a big, sturdy boat. She hired the exact same type of boat. They took her to Puerto Albaldia. They went to the dock. She got out of the boat, went into the same immigration office and, you know, applied for a tourist visa for Panama, whatever that involves. And then they stamped her passport. She got back in the boat and continued on. So if she was able to get a tourist visa, it seems to me that Bald and Timmy could have done the same thing because they were legal. Like up until that point, they were legal. Like they talked about how they were trying to enter the country illegally with the smugglers, but the smugglers took them to an official entry point with an immigration office. So technically, there was nothing illegal about what they did. They had valid passports, you know, one from the UK, one from Greece. So I don't understand why they couldn't have just gotten a visa while they were there and then they could have hiked through the jungle and gone with the migrants but they would have had a, a tourist stamp for panama right a lot of the venezuelan migrants they they would not be eligible for a visa for panama they can't get one and a lot of them don't even have a passport or their passport will be expired but bald and timmy they both had passports that are good in panama if they land, if they flew into the country or they came overland from the north, they could cross at the border and get a, get a tourist visa, land at the airport, go to immigration, get stamped into the country, pay $20 or $30, whatever it is. So why couldn't they do that in Puerto Obaldia? Because they were in an immigration office. So I kind of needed that explained to me as well. So it seems to me that if they come around the peninsula on this boat and they land at the dock and then, I mean, as I said, it's an official entry point into the country with an immigration office and there might have been officials at the dock, soldiers or uh, government people, whatever, and they stop them and talk to them and say, oh, who are you and what are you doing? And say, oh, it feels like someone would say to them, oh, okay, well, you need to get a visa. And we have an immigration office here, so just uh, head this way, come with me. And then they take them to the immigration office and they just get processed and get a, get a visa stamp, right? I, I don't see why this wouldn't have been suggested to them. If they had gone into the jungle from Capragana or Akandi, well, yeah, on the very first day, 
they go up a hill and then you run into the border. There's a stone marker there. Colombia on one side, Panama on the other. As soon as you step over that line, you have entered the country illegally. That's obvious. So even Bald and Timmy, they're from the UK and from uh, Greece, and they can show their passports, but they've still entered the country illegally. But if they, if they land at the dock in Porto Albaldia, it's not automatic that they've entered the country illegally yet because th they have an immigration office. So I, I, again, like I don't, I don't get it. You know, it's sort of like, um, you know, arriving here in Port Dixon from Sumatra, if I hired a private boat secretly to take me from Sumatra and drop me off on the coast right outside of the seafront hotel, okay, I've entered Malaysia illegally by boat and I would be arrested. But I took a boat that took me to the dock and at the dock there is an immigration office and I went through immigration and got a visa stamp. So that, and that's exactly what Bald and Timmy did. They took a boat to a dock and there's an immigration office and they could go through immigration and yet somehow it ended up with them as they said being arrested by the military thrown in a prison cell held there and then kicked out of the country so the whole story just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me and um, yeah i'd like to know what really happened it's possible maybe that that immigration office just can't issue visas anymore maybe that has been stopped, but even then, um, it's still an official entry point. So the worst that would happen is that you show up and they say, oh, no, actually, we, we don't issue tourist visas at this office anymore. So we, you know, we can't let you into the country. But it's still a valid entry point. Like nothing they had done was illegal yet. So why were they arrested by the soldiers? Of course, you could say, well, they were arrested because they went into the jungle with their guide and tried to go in illegally. That's what Bald says, but my sense is that's not true because he has no video of that at all. He doesn't show the beginning of their trek, meeting the guide, getting ready to enter the jungle. I'm 100% I'm positive that if they actually met their guide, this Juan Lopez that they were supposed to meet up with, and they put on their little bracelet to show that they paid the cartel for security. And then they started walking along a trail into the jungle. And then after two or three hours of hiking, then they ran into the soldiers. If that happened, he would have video of some of it. It only makes sense. It would have been an, uh, probably like one of the most dramatic moments of their journey. These two never stopped talking about the dangers they were going to be facing. There's no way they would start the actual hike into the jungle without filming a little bit more talk about the dangers. So I'm positive they never went into the jungle. They never ran into soldiers in the jungle. So technically, they didn't do anything illegal. So why were they held in prison? Uh, the whole thing, none of, it, uh, none of it makes sense to me. But the thing about Timmy's video, as I said, is he showed more of the coastline. So because I saw a video of the coastline, I was able to compare it with photographs on Google Maps, and I could see, ah, Porto Orbaldia. I, I recognize the same dock, the same building, the same trees. You can match them up, you know. So I kind of enjoyed Timmy's video from that point of view because he showed a lot more than uh, Bald did. And donning my uh, Planet Doug video detective hat, um, I, I saw some other issues in Timmy's video that really confused me. Um, I, I mean, he's, he's not a native speaker of English. He's from Greece. His English is more than good enough for YouTube, of course. So his vocabulary is not always quite accurate. But what really puzzled me in a way, I, I don't know what to think of this, he kept talking about the mafia. Mafia this, mafia is watching us, you know, we had to pay the mafia, the mafia could kill us, we have to hide our identity. Talks a lot about how they have to pretend to be Russians, because if the mafia knows that, you know, we're documenting this for YouTube, they could, you know, 
They, they might kidnap us and hold us for ransom, or we might get robbed, who knows. But he kept saying mafia all the time. And yet, of course, it's not mafia, it's the cartel. So I don't know why he didn't use the word cartel. Did nobody stop him at some point? He says, well, nobody here is mafia, the, you know, cartel. But setting that aside, he talked constantly, as I said, about how he had so much trouble filming because the mafia were watching them and the mafia were really suspicious and he could never film anything because the mafia were always there, always watching and he made it sound like they were in danger for their lives while they were filming in secret. And yet he had a ton of wide shots of these big groups of migrants, you know, the whole crowd of people that they're, they're hiking with and then at night they set up their tents, they got a big campsite, everything, a lot of wide shots. And, you know, Detective Doug here, you know, I'm pausing all of these saving screenshots and I'm zooming in and looking around. In none of these shots do I ever see anyone that looks remotely like a guide of any kind or cartel. Um, like he makes it sound like there's 10 of these men surrounding them with guns or something. And yet when you look at the overall scene, it's just a bunch of families unprepared families hiking through the jungle. I never see any of these people. And my understanding from all the other videos I've seen, the cartel is on the Colombian side. So they start in Colombia, you pay a fee to get a guide, and the guide is either part of the cartels, or he's connected to the cartel, or he's a local private guide, but he has to pay off the cartel Anyway, the cartel is involved, and then these men go with you as guides, but they can only go as far as the border with Panama. And then they get to this big stone, the border marking stone, and then on, from there, the cartel, so like, hey, you're on your own from this point. Their guides go back. That's as far as they take them, and their cartel, you know, whether, you know, it, it kind of gets confusing, because sometimes they talk about the cartel as being evil men who could rob them and kill them and in other situations the cartel are there to protect them that they're paying for protection and then suddenly the bad guys are the indigenous people they are all the robbers and the cartel the mafia is protecting them from the indigenous people who are all robbers and rapists so it gets a little bit confusing but then timmy he keeps switching back and forth between that all the time, depending on the mood that he's trying to establish. But on the very first day of their hiking, the very first day out of Capragana, very early in the day, they got to the top of the hill and there was the marker. Panama on one side, Colombia on the other. And he, you know, he filmed all of that. And then they went over the border, down the hill on the other side, and then they set up camp at the river. So my understanding is the cartel gets them to that point and then lets them go on their own from there. They no longer have cartel protection. There's only cartel protection on the Colombian side. So that's my understanding. But as they're going down the other side, Timmy kept talking about, oh, I can't film guys because the mafia is watching us. The mafias, you know, will get very upset. And if they see me filming, I could be killed. I could be robbed. I could be, you know, the mafia is always this danger around him lurking all the time and oh they're watching me the mafia is watching me but then they got to the camp and suddenly he said well we are in great danger from the indigenous people the indigenous people are here and they are robbers and they could rob us and we no longer have the mafia protecting us the mafia is no longer here anymore so suddenly now that we had indigenous people as the threat all the mafia he kept talking about, they just vanished. They weren't there anymore. So I ended up wondering, okay, what is it? Are the mafia with you and being suspicious, suspicious of you all the time? Or did the mafia just let you go once you reach the border? Because he talked about one minute, he's talking about how the mafia is watching his every move and very suspicious of them. The very next minute, he's talking about how we no longer have mafia protection and now we are in danger from the indigenous people. So anyway, there was like a real going back and forth between this, like, okay, like, are the mafia with you or are they not? 
it, it kept ch it kept changing his story and and it made me suspect you know i didn't really trust the story that uh, that he was telling about that another issue i had with bald's video was the length of the trek through the darien jungle because he said on multiple occasions that it took five days and yet in the video the video only accounts for two and a half so there's two nights of camping and on the third day they arrived at a village a town and then from there they could take a boat that takes them to the official refugee migrant processing center so that was from bald's point of view timmy's video is a bit more detailed um, I, I did a deep dive into comparing the two videos and in timmy's video you can see the two nights of camping so you know it's day one day you know night one of camping day two day two day night two of camping and then he shows a third night of camping so he actually shows three nights in the jungle bald only shows two but then on the fourth day according to timmy's video they landed at the town so their journey they spent three nights in the jungle according to bald's video they spent two nights in the jungle but bald says the journey took five days uh timmy when he arrives at the town he says they were in the jungle for six days so he, they can't even agree on how many days they were in the jungle and none of it lines up with what they show in the video so I'm not, I don't know. I don't know how long they were in the jungle. I don't know how much hiking they did. And um, my instinct is that they were in the jungle for far less time than they're claiming. And that is supported by, you know, the fact that they had no water to drink anyway, didn't have enough food. Um, they ran out of food very early. And if they were really in the jungle for six days, the lack of water and food would have been a much bigger problem than it seemed to be. You know, according, you know, from what I saw in Bald's video, they kind of went for, without food for one day, something like that. Like on the last day, they ran out of food. And at the end of that day, they arrived in the town where they could just go to a store and buy Gatorade and f whatever food they wanted. So anyway, everything seems to support that they were not in the jungle for six days, as Timmy claimed and not even in the jungle for five days as bald claims so yeah i'd like to know what the truth is you know exactly but as i said there was more information in timmy's video than in bald's video and you could really see this when they finally got to the town and got in the boat and then the boat took them to the processing center like a camp an official camp and then they spent Again, I don't know whether to trust them or not, but they say they spent like seven or eight days in the center before they were put on buses and then driven to the border with Costa Rica. Ball didn't show any of that, the end part of their journey, but Timmy did, and uh, you know more about that in a minute. But Timmy did show them, he showed a lot of detail in this town that they arrived at, a kind of a small village and he showed that and then he showed them going to the river and all of the migrants that they had been hiking with they all went to the river at the same time and then they have to pay 20 or 40 dollars for a seat on one of these boats like big long canoes and it's all very official you know you buy a ticket and then you pay and they give you a life jacket and you all sit in a big row on this boat and then timmy heard that it would take about four hours to get from there to the town where the official processing center was and he showed all that and he showed them sitting on the boat you know during the journey on the river and bald didn't really show any of that so i like timmy's video from that point of view but then when they got to the processing center i had a lot of questions again and i always had a feeling like i couldn't quite trust what they were showing me and what they were telling me so, for example, they said nothing but negative things about this camp. They, you know, in their video titles, they call it a prison camp. 
and then they talked about how the guards you know were military with lots of guns and they said they were horrible people terrible people evil people um, treating them terribly badly and they said nothing but negative things about this place and so for example at one point they said you know well, we were held there for you know we're, we're being held here against our will in a prison camp and there's like hundreds of people jammed into this place with no room for people to sleep and they showed video of this area with a floor crowded with people sleeping on the floor and then all these beds filled with people again implying that this is where they were living for seven days but in the video itself it shows him and bald in a huge room with probably 200 beds completely empty except for them they were the only people in this vast empty space that had like bunk beds like army style bunk beds just lining this big room from wall to wall and then way in one side by the windows there's Timmy in his top bunk and then bald beside him in his top bunk and then they you know his video shows the rest of the room and it's completely empty so which is it were they jammed in this like where was this crowded room like where did they get that video clip where it looked like an overpacked prison with people sleeping on the floor where was that taken who was who were all those people and then how is it that in fact you're sleeping all by yourself in this giant empty space and bald he showed a bit more of the camp like he showed that they had like you know again everything is relative of course if you are you know compared to staying at the sheraton hotel yeah this camp was pretty rough but if you had just come out of the jungle you had just come out of six days of hiking through the darien gap with deadly dangers on all sides this camp would feel like paradise i mean i think you should feel grateful that this camp exists because there's no reason for it to exist somebody is paying for all this stuff somebody's paying for the construction of these buildings paid for these beds paid for the showers they had really nice showers there with tons of water pressure porta potties there um, big tubs with water you could clean your clothes do things somebody is paying for all of that and there's no reason that it has to be there you know the panamanian government the u.s government humanitarian groups you know ngos the united nations you know tons of money is being spent to build this place for you so it feels like a pretty i think if i showed up there after six days in the jungle i would be like man i'm i'm sure glad this place exists right and they resent that they were held there against their will but what do you want you entered the country illegally with thousands of illegal migrants they can't just welcome to panama march you know just let you go like what what did you think was going to happen it all seemed a little bit weird to me and then bald didn't show any of this but timmy showed a, a time when they were having uh lunch i was wondering where was the food coming from because they'd been they were there for like a week but bald didn't talk about anything about how they were feeding themselves and water and stuff like that but then uh, timmy did show these huge piles of styrofoam lunch boxes and there was an announcement coming over the speakers that today lunch and dinner was being served at the same time which you know kind of meant to me that well normally they get lunch delivered to them and then they get dinner delivered to them but on this particular day logistically they were giving them lunch and dinner at the same time so everybody would get two of these lunch boxes one for lunch one for dinner and then they showed he showed timmy and bald eating their lunch and then they were complaining about it like he was like opening it and uh, the chicken like chicken and rice and again implying that they were being held in a prison camp being served terrible food and again i'm thinking what are you like what are you complaining about um you entered the country illegally they give you this really nice clean empty place to sleep 
nice showers, porta potties. I guess there's electricity there because they're charging things all the time. They're listening to music on their smartphones. They're hanging out and they're bringing you three meals a day and just giving it to you pre-prepared. Sure, it's not, uh, you know, the gourmet food, but you're getting chicken and rice served to you, you know, three times a day. There's coffee there apparently. But again, were they paying for these meals? Maybe they had to pay for them. I don't know. They don't mention that. But it all seemed a little bit weird to me, um, their whole attitude towards this place. But I was really grateful that Timmy showed much more of the environment, you know, showed where they were sleeping, where they were eating. Bald, he showed the showers and the bathrooms and the cleaning area and stuff like that. Again, water. I don't know where water was coming from for drinking. I don't think I ever saw them with a water bottle, but I'm sure water was supplied, you know, drinking water was supplied as well. And um, yeah, it just took them a while to figure out what to do with them. Because I guess there was a system in place to process migrants from Venezuela and Bangladesh and China and Cameroon. But when they showed up with their passports from the UK and Greece, and they had a lot of money, the system didn't know how to deal with them. That's kind of what they were saying. And that's, you know, that there's no, they, they don't know what to do with us. So they're trying to figure out what do we do with these guys? You know, they, they did enter illegally. So we can't just give them a tourist visa and let them go. They probably didn't even have a stamp there to stamp in a tourist visa stamp. They have to process them according to the systems they have, but their systems were designed for illegal migrants. So like, what do we do with these doofuses from the UK and Greece? And I guess it took them seven or eight days to figure this out. And then eventually they were put on the buses to Costa Rica. And for me, that was the most interesting part of the video. Cause again, Bald didn't show any of this. Maybe he will show it in his next video, but Timmy did, but he just jumps way ahead and he, sh he included this clip of them on the highway. They're standing outside of their bus on the highway. And Timmy was saying, oh, we finally left the prison camp. They put us on a bus and we're on our way to the Costa Rican border. They're delivering us, driving us all the way through Panama to the border with Costa Rica. And then he panned his camera the length of the highway and the highway from horizon to horizon was nothing but migrant buses. I tried to count them, but I couldn't even count them. I'm guessing there's at least 20 of them, maybe more. But it was like a, a huge convoy of at least 20 buses, each one packed with illegal migrants, taking them from the Darien Gap. They've been processed, all the migrants loaded into this huge convoy of buses and then they all drive through Panama, like a 14, 15 hour journey till they get to the border with Costa Rica. And that's where the video ends. But I was so grateful to Timmy that he actually showed the buses. It was like, if you told me that that's how it worked, I wouldn't have believed you. Cause it doesn't make any sense to me that there's such an organized systematic process in place that delivers you by bus to the border with Costa Rica and then lets you go. I mean, everything I read says that was what happens, but I didn't really believe it because it doesn't make any sense. But Timmy actually showed the convoy and I'm thinking, why? Like how, how, how does this happen? And what's the official policy behind it? Because in the media, of course, from in the United States, there is nothing but stories about how they're trying to control the border and prevent people from getting to the border and crossing the border illegally. That is the goal of the United States. And yet somehow there's a system in place where every day 20 busloads of illegal migrants are being funneled out of the Darien Gap and then just being driven to the border with Costa Rica and then just like, sent on their way. So how does that system exist? I, I just don't get it. It's very, very confusing to me. 
So that is the, the end of uh, Timmy's video, and I think that's all I wanted to uh, say about it. But now I'm really hoping that his video, his next one, will pick up still on the buses. Like, I don't want them to suddenly be in Mexico. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that that is what's going to happen in both Bold's and Timmy's um, YouTube, you know, documentary about their experience. But I'm hoping that we will now see the buses arrive at the border with Costa Rica because I want to know what's going to happen to them. You know, Bald has his passport from the UK. What has been stamped in his passport? And when the buses get them to Costa Rica, what happens? Um, how, like, how many people are in each convoy? Hundreds of them, right? Hundreds of illegal migrants with or without a passport. There's no way the Venezuelans who didn't have a passport suddenly have one. So when hundreds of them arrive at the Costa Rican border, how do they get through immigration and get accepted into Costa Rica when they don't even have a passport? And then in Bald's case, he has a valid passport from the UK, but when he gets to the immigration desk in Costa Rica at the border crossing, like what happens there? What kind of a stamp does he get? How do they stamp him out of Panama and into Costa Rica? I assume, you know, because he's from the UK and because he has resources, he has money, um, he will be given, you know, clearance as a tourist to enter Costa Rica. By the time he gets through it, he will have a tourist visa for Costa Rica and he can just continue on his way with the migrants or without them. But what happens to everybody else that have has no money for one thing and may not even have a passport may not even have a valid passport um yeah i mean once if they if the migrants get into costa rica okay maybe they can scatter and now they have to get across the next border sneak across all the other remaining borders illegally one by one hoping not to get caught until they finally get to mexico that kind of makes sense to me but I don't understand the Panama-Costa Rica connection. Why is Costa Rica just allowing this to happen? Um, how are they going to process these hundreds of illegal migrants who are arriving every single day, probably thousands of them? And it's not like these are uh, people trying to sneak across the border. They're all in buses. They're all being transported by a convoy of buses right up to their uh, immigration border crossing checkpoint. So yeah, they have to do something with them officially. And I honestly don't know how that works. I would, I would, I would absolutely love to know. I really would. So yeah, that is it, I guess, for my thoughts about uh, Timmy's video. As far as I know, Bald and Bankrupt hasn't posted his next video yet. Uh, let me double check just to see. No, he has not posted his next video. And I guess that's not surprising. Lately, there are big gaps between all his videos. I'm just looking at his channel right now. And there was a video eight months ago in Colombia. And then seven months ago, like a month later, there's another video. I don't know where that one is located. And then two months after that, there's one video from Mongolia. And then three months after that, there's one video from Bangladesh. Then, yeah, it's three videos from Bangladesh two months ago. But there's gaps of like two or three months between his videos. And then two months gap between Bangladesh and his first video in uh, the Darien Gap. And his last one was about two weeks ago. So it looks like we have to wait a few more days, maybe two or three more weeks before we see the next video. Yeah, it's kind of funny, you know, <laughs> looking at his videos, like from Bangladesh in particular. Uh, the very first one is called, Nobody Visits This Country. Find out why you should. And it has uh, 2.7 million views. I went to Bangladesh and uh, shot very similar videos to the ones he posted but uh, nobody watched my videos <laughs> you know it's like hey he says nobody visits this country well 
and that you know that's why he gets 2.7 million views i went to that country but uh, nobody watched my videos from uh, bangladesh and uh, his next video was on the river um he calls it the uh the world's cheapest vip cruise for twelve dollars to take one of the boats on the the river in uh, dhaka 1.6 million views I, uh, I spent a lot of time down at that river and I rode in these boats as well, um, but nobody watched uh, my video from that boat. <laughs> oh well, anyway, that's the end of uh, my little look at Timmy's video and I'm looking forward to the next one. I'm curious how their journey ends, his and Bald's uh, journey through the Darien Gap and onward from there. So that's it for uh, behind the scenes today. I'm going to shut down, go have some lunch, and uh, I'll see you in the next video.